Uh, okay, it's my great honor to convene this last panel of our uh, uh, our talks today. Uh, this panel, that one, okay, is called "When Theology Meets Politics: Britain, Israel, and the Common Good." And we have uh, two speakers and a respondent today. Our first speaker is uh, Baron Maurice Glassman, who is an English academic, social thinker, and labor life peer in the House of Lords. He's a senior lecturer in political theory at London Metropolitan University and director of its Faith and Citizenship program. Uh, he's best known as the founder of Blue Labor, which is a term you've actually invented yourself. <laughs> Please. <laughs> Thank you. So uh, I'll use the limit of my Hebrew and say Shalom Chavirim. That's very, uh, very good to, to be here and to really uh, thank Elon for the invitation and to really, really thank Natalie for your very gracious and lovely work and to say how really great it's been. Uh, to be here. I particularly want to mention I really enjoyed the talk today by Professor Bizaglo. I thought, I think if you want to know about Blue Labour, that's quite close. It's been wonderful to hear um, Nisim, to hear um, Adam. I really thought that the concept of, I never thought I'd hear it at a conference of what we used to call Shalom Bias, of Shalom Bayit. It was very, very good. and. and and it's great to see my old friend Yossi here and also to meet Yael. I've got to say that when I first heard of, of Shacharit, um, that, that wasn't really great because um, Shacharit is the one service I never attended. It was um, much too early in the morning. And if you go to the Shabbat service, if, you go, if, you're, if you're there for Shacharit, that's a lot of hours, so I tend to get there for you know the laning and then to do the musaf. So um, it took a bit of, you know, I thought shacharit really not really for me, but um, I thought if it was called mincha, you know, I could I could be tempted by that. But um, but I, I met I met Elon and um, Elon really persuaded me uh, that this was a good thing and and the connection was the, through community organising. I think that's we met through a guy called Arnie Graf, who's a really great organiser who's coming next week. So I urge you, those of you who are going to meet him, treat him like the angel that he is. Um, he's like one of those angels that came to Abraham with Sarah. You know, he brings real greatness and, and taught me a huge amount. And the work I did with um, London citizens, so broad-based organising, and I worked for a lot of years, about 15 years, in a broad-based coalition, which was initially called the East London Communities Organisation, then became London Citizen, now I believe it's Citizens UK. Doesn't sound quite as good. Um, and we worked essentially on a living wage. That was the big campaign. So bringing together churches, mosques, and interestingly, we tried to engage secular organisations. That wasn't quite so successful because the, essentially the contracted out cleaners, the contracted out cooks, the people who actually do the work of you know, cleaning, cleaning people's bottoms in care homes, cleaning toilets, they weren't in unions and, they, and the relationship of trust that they had was fundamentally with their faith institutions. So that was a big eye-opener eye -opener for me. And then organizing and developing leadership from within those congregations and within the cooks, the cleaners, the security guards. And uh, to win a living wage, when we started with the living wage, they told us that it was illegal. That was the first thing, of course. The first move is, is a, a, a legal move. And then they told us that it was impossible. But we won it, and we won it right across, right across London. And um, and now it's become a uh, national policy. And the other one, which I sort of wanted to tell you about, was a more complicated one, was an anti-usury campaign. So, as you can imagine, that was a, a bit difficult one, being Jewish. So, essentially, 
we had this crash in 2008, you know, financial crash, and the banks essentially were borrowing money at half a percent. But through a chain of things, they were lending to poor people at 5,000 percent. That was how it was going. So that was a, a sort of brought home to me that there was a problem. So can you imagine a Christian and a Muslim run anti-usury campaign, particularly when the largest um, usurious institution was an institution called Wonga, which was run, of course, by a South African Litvak, you know. So, um, you know, it's those Litvaks again. They always, they always do it to you. And, um, and, and so what I tried then to do, that's when it really brought home to me to try and engage the Jewish community in the community organising, because the Jewish community um, couldn't, get them really, couldn't get them really involved. And there were various issues with that. One of them was that the Jewish community in, in London used to be poor, but is no longer poor. And so they really don't have um, a serious relationship or, or a living relationship with poor people beyond the au pair, the cleaners, the various, the various um, sort of relationships with, with low paid people. And they sort of got out, got out of the habit of politics. And that was interesting to me because the founders of community, or the founder of community organising was Saul Alinsky, who was a Jew from Chicago, and Arnie Graf was the guy who taught me, and other guy. So a lot of the organisers were Jewish, but the there was no Jewish participation. So that that really led me to to think about things and. Um, just to let you know, it didn't go really well. So we launched the anti-usury campaign. I think this is a really relevant story in relation to the Mizrahi Ashkenazi thing. We launched it at the Bevis Mark Synagogue, which is the oldest synagogue. It's, it's, so, it's so Mizrahi that it's called the Spanish and Portuguese Synagogue. Okay, it was founded in 1600, so they, they really, and they still consider themselves Spanish and Portuguese, really lovely rabbi called Natan Levy, and we did this beautiful launch event um, where there were people from the black church, people from the local mosque, um, Jews, and we launched this anti-usury campaign as a Jewish-led um, institution, launching it from a synagogue. Unfortunately, when the synagogue committee heard that he allowed all these Muslims and black people into the synagogue, they actually sacked him. So that was not a really great start. But um, we kind of got through that. He found another job. And then I realised that the origins of this community organising and the sort of building, the specific form of building these relationships um, was, was really rooted, I think, in, in Jewish history. So a very large... So you could see, if you want to know about Blue Labour, half of it is the inheritance of the Bund, and half of it is sort of Samson, Rafael Hirsch, modern orthodoxy, the whole idea of self-organised communities of a kahila, of the schools, of the burial society, of the baths. So a kind of bringing together of those things. And Alinsky grew up within the Adas, within, within that, and was very influenced by the Bund. So in many ways, I tried to make the connection um, with community or um, blue labour in relation to um, a Jewish tradition, essentially, of, of um, an exilic politics. So that's what blue labour was really about. So I just want to talk a little bit about the common good, which is what that is about. And the three essential features of the common good are, the first of all, the reconciliation of estranged interests. There's a recognition of pluralism and a recognition of estrangement. Um, that there is something that's not happening and what's not happening is a relationship between particular um, interests, traditions, whichever way you want to call them. So one of the major ones there is, is there's a major um, estrangement between religious and secular um, that, that, that has grown quite wide. And then there's obviously relationships bet within and between religions in fact, it went, the end point with the Jewish story, the London Citizens became, I think, the only organisation that the Orthodox, the Liberal and the Reform all joined. I always thought it was because non-Jews were involved and they didn't want to embarrass themselves. But anyway, that, that was some kind of um, achievement. But obviously also between capital and labour, between rich and poor, um, and geographically 
you could say between north and south, or you could say, you know, is it is it possible to have a common good between Jerusalem and Tel Aviv? I leave that with you. The second feature of the common good is is always a stress, which was definitely brought out this morning by both speakers, about the dignity of labour. Of of there's a tradition within the common good of vocation, of looking at vocation, of virtue, and of and of respect for for work, and that brings it to another thing that was mentioned today, a very strong relationship with Catholic social thought. In fact, giving this talk, it reminds me I was invited to the to the Vatican to give a talk to the to the Pope on Catholic social thought. I thought that was a bit funny, but they invited me and and I, I gave the talk on a Friday afternoon at 5.30. So if you know anything about Italy, you'd know that it's even worse than giving a talk in Tel Aviv on Monday afternoon at 10 past five, in that everybody absolutely just wanted to go home. Um, and Catholic social thought is a very interesting, I think very exilic form of, of thought, which really stresses um, the balance of interests uh, dignity of labour, the importance of a balance of power in corporate governance, and it's it's. I just find it very interesting the the Jews split. So, what's interesting in in Jewish thought is that there's a really extensive agricultural thought, but there's not a really extensive within the Jewish tradition critique of capitalism. But the critique of capitalism led to a rupture, a rupture between the secular left, which we know, which you know, we're part of. Today, by the way, I bought this shirt especially because I thought that if I'm going to, on, on Yom Hartzmaut in England, this is what we wear. We wear a short sleeve white shirt and jeans when we were at school. So I thought I'd honour my first talk in Israel by wearing my Yom Hartzmaut clothes. But um, it's, it's certainly the case that there was this rupture between communism, socialism, secularism, which did have a very strong critique of capitalism. Um, in Catholicism, they actually managed to develop the thought within the religion itself. The third element is, is a very strong role for institutions and interests, and particularly institutions that mediate between, you know, the classic thing with liberalism is there's the individual and there's the state, the individual and the collective, but the common good is based on a representation of interests and their negotiation. Um, between the individual and the state. So they're the features of the common good that I wanted to raise. But I also wanted to raise a point about liberalism, um, which is that liberalism is not um, a democratic theory and, and, and has, has never been a democratic theory. In my view, it's not really a political theory. It's a legal theory. It's a theory of legal order. Uh, based on the priority of rights, usually based on some act of consent. You know, it could be the establishment of a constitution at some point. We heard a lot today about the 1948 constitution. Um, and, and, and so it's based on the primacy of the individual and of property rights and of a collective legal order. So there were, there were huge limits as regards thinking about democracy. So we talk about liberal democracy without really recognizing that the democracy and the liberalism are really fundamentally um, opposed because there's such constraints and limits put on the power of democracy. So the first thing really, that's the first thing to say. The second thing to say about liberalism is that it, it has a really implausible or no view about what constitutes a human being. Right? So it's based on choice without having any notion of how we are constituted and, and formed. It has really a nutty conception of a person as a kind of chooser without any thought of the forms um, of that choosing. You know, there's a fundamental link, uh, you could ask me about it later, between mentalism and fundamentalism. And liberalism is definitely a form of mentalism, where we're disembodied abstract beings making abstract generalized choices. That's why, Adam, I really enjoyed your paper yesterday, it is that it has no idea of an embedded, embodied human being and what that means. In other, in other words, it has no theory of social anthropology whatever. That's the, that's the reality. So that's a bit of a problem. Um, the second issue is that it has never been able to develop any sort of analysis of power, and um, particularly of, of capitalist power, um, has no ultimate theory 
of society, of what constitutes the social. So once again, everything is resolved down to the individual and the collective, the rule of law, um, and a the theory of rights. And it's, and it's no accident at all that therefore it has no theory of Shabbat, of, of Sabbath, of ritual, of, of suspension of time. Um, all time is continuous, all time is endless, and it must be now, right? Peace, now. Uh, we want it, when do we want it? Now, yeah, and so um, in, in many ways it's a very impatient theory, and obviously a lack of patience is the absolute enemy of any meaningful politics, because it means that you can't um, actually find the time to build relationships and argue and disagree and find messy compromises, because it actually, and I thought Adam brought the point out excellently, it likes to begin with the conclusion and work back from there, and it doesn't take people as as, as they find them. And the final real big problem with liberalism is, is, is its inability. For a start, I would just say it's, it's incapable of generating any genuine beauty, but we set that aside. It shares that with socialism. Um, the, the, the fundamental problem is that it has no conception of paradox, which is the fundamental way of thinking about politics, I think. So blue labor was based on this idea of par paradox. So I'll give you some examples that the old is the new. So what we, are we keep on thinking that we're dealing with new times. We're not dealing with, with new times. I've come, to, I've come to Israel. You know, you're surrounded by people, Arabs, Persians, Kurds. Next week, I'm going to Kurdistan, to Erbil. If you can find some love in your heart, please find some love for the Kurds. They're, it's even worse for them than for the Jews. You know, every turn of events is worse for them. You know, it's very difficult. They're fighting ISIS. But these are very old peoples in relation with each other. Um, the second, you know, another example of paradox is that cooperation is nece necessary for competition, that those countries with the greatest degree of cooperation in vocational skills, in educational formation, um, are of greatest degree. So another example of paradox is that tradition is necessary for modernization, that you can't modernize out of nothing, that we have this idea of modernity as this new, some, a rupture, but it's always a continuation. And of course, the paradox that the left should remember the most is that no one is more exclusive than those who believe in inclusivity. You know, you never get more excluded than by those who have a culture of diversity and, and inclusivity. So I just wanted to raise that I think paradox is fundamental, and that gets to the heart of of the talk that, that I wish to give here, the sort of insight that I wish to share with you. And I, when I was traveling in today, traveled because the old is the new in Tel Aviv, past Jeremiah, Jeremiah Street, the street of Jeremiah the prophet. And Jeremiah is obviously my favorite prophet because he was the first prophet of exile of, of Galut. And in verse 28 of Jeremiah, he does that transition where he says seek the peace of the city because in its peace you will find peace and I've always found that very inspiring and very interesting so to just give my sort of polemical paradox that I'm going to present to you today the Zionism can only be good can only be redeemed when it recognizes the virtues of exile when it heals this rejection of Galut and it makes the move, as Jeremiah made the move, from Yerushalayim, the city of peace, to Shalom Ha'ir, to the peace of the city, which recognizes that the peace is a contingent, negotiated space, which is constantly liable, like all relationships and marriages, to terrible failure, but has the promise of delaying that failure for another week, another year. Um, you know, that, that's where we are. So that the very thing that Zionism was invented to deny, which was the remarkable virtues of exile and Jewish life, of strong institutional self-government, of our schools, of our preservation of, of language, of our burial societies, our ritual baths, um, and then the way that that spread into urban life and the building of strong civic institutions, educational institutions, cultural institutions. The Zionism can only be redeemed, redeemed by a reconciliation with exile. So that's, that's essentially the paradox that I'm presenting you today. And just to add, 
to the paradox that that the that radicalism and, and, and the left and, and the Zionist labor tradition, which I'm from, has to rediscover conservatism. It has to rediscover, that's what I found really interesting with what Professor Bizoglo said today. So when I worked, what I learned when I worked with the cooks and the cleaners and the security guards is they were absolutely the same as my mum. You know, they valued family a lot. They decency, a sense of place, a sense of the modest virtues. And that brings into another theme that was related to yesterday, which is that the politics that I present, Blue Labour, is absolutely simultaneously anti-messianic and anti-revolutionary. That this idea of a revolution is a fantasy. That's the idea that there can be a rupture. And I think the Zionism had this revolutionary aspect, that it was going to transcend Galut. It was going to overcome um, the realities of being a small, weak, people through some form of um, revolutionary transformation and, and that it needs to relearn this relationship between radicalism and conservatism because essentially you know when I was listening to to Nissim and I was listening to you speak yesterday you know when you talk about your friends and your you know I'm with your friends you know in that story it's just to let it is the you know this idea that you reject all existing morality for the end. You know, Bernstein, there's another street in Tel Aviv I passed, Edward Bernstein, he said, the movement is everything, the ends are nothing. And we've got to relearn that, that to rebuild the relationships, rebuild a sense of, of place. So um, in that sense, I would say that this is, you know, it's, it's, it's an Aristotelian politics. It begins with the doxo or the orthodoxies, to use a very good word that I'm very fond of, um, of the people. You begin with where the people are, and um, and you can see that the that the weakness of the left right through the 20th century was an over fondness for a political position, an a priori generalised position, rather than a relationship with the people. In in England. Uh, um, we had a very strong Labour Party, a strong Labour Party that was hated on the left because it was so conservative. It never th threatened the monarchy, it never threatened the House of Lords. It was embedded in the life of people built around strengthening a family, resisting capitalism, um, strengthening a sense of place and of the work ethic. And it faced down communism and it faced down fascism. But if you look at European social democratic parties, they were often quite radical parties who didn't have that strong relationship. And of course we know what happened, they all left. And just to let you know about the old is the new. Arnie Graf can talk about it, but when he came over from America, he was really shocked by the culture of the Labour Party. So the average length of time, just to let you know, because he's, he's a guy who uses a stopwatch, the average length of time between a Labour Party member, MP, organiser, whatever you like, talking to a member of the public, and then interrupting them to tell them that they're wrong is eight seconds. Okay, that's it. So people say, I'm worried about immigration. No, you're not. No, you're worried about housing and you're worried about education. And they go, no, I'm not. I'm, no, no, you're not. And there's a certain, there's what I call a left-wing voice that goes, no, you're not, right? Because you are mistaken. You are mistaken. You are in false consciousness. And just think about the arrogance of that from a group of people who believed in central planning, from a group of people who believed in the five-year plan, who believed in the dictatorship of the... Nothing seems to dent our confidence. It's really an interesting thing. So we did what we did was 5,000 one-to-one conversations. And we did it with Labour sympathisers. And in order to get out of the problem of what do you want because that led to the argument. What we asked was what people cared about. And it turned out that overwhelmingly and beyond everything and way over 90% and mattered more than anything to people was family. That was bad news for the left right there. So um, <laughs> that they actually cared about their parents and they cared about their children and some of them even cared about each other. I mean, I know, it shouldn't be, 
but it was. And family actually very generously conceived quite an extended, you know, a conception of love and obligation and how do you fulfill your obligation to your family. Um, that was way ahead. And then the second thing that once again was taken as when we took this stuff to central office, it was treated like some counter-revolutionary concoction. Uh, the second thing that people cared about was the place that they lived. Can you imagine that? In the age of Twitter and the internet, they actually cared about where they lived. And they felt that where they lived was degraded and somehow devalued, um, particularly people who lived in the equivalent, the English equivalent of the development towns. They just felt that they were abandoned and they were taken over by bad things. And the third thing, which really shouldn't be bad news um, for Labour, what was considered bad news was work. People still cared about the, how they were treated at work and the dignity of their work. So family, place and work. I'm just saying the old is the new. If you look at the foundation of the Labour movement in the 1880s, exactly the same. Things are completely unchanged in terms of what people care about. But somehow we persuade that what they... So tell you words that were never mentioned. Never mentioned in all these conversations. Equality, diversity, inclusivity, accessibility, human rights. These were, these were not things that people you know, actually ever said when you asked them what they cared about. They cared about their family, the place they lived in, and their work. And that's the basis of a genuinely radical agenda, just to support relationships, to honour the dignity of work, to redistribute capital and power to places, is, I think, a very good agenda. Um, so I've got it. So I've got five minutes. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to rattle through uh, a few things that I just want to sh share with you. So we had a conference, a long came of people from all over the world, a Blue Labour conference. They came from Australia, they came from Turkey, they came from Denmark, they came from, from, from Germany. They really came from far and wide, and they came to tell us exactly the same things. Um, that was interesting. That all over the world, the left elite is really disliked by people, and they're disliked because we're arrogant and we think we know better than them, and they actually don't want to be us. I know. Amazing. They don't want to be sort of confused, unhappy, and middle-aged without really, <laughs> and permanently depressed. They don't want to be like that. So um, I, I can't understand them, but that's what they're like. Um, that that the, the things that come out is, is that we have, as a secular inheritance, we have no conception of our own sin. That they think that we're really not just arrogant, but we learn nothing. That all the things that we have done in power from Stalinism to terrible adoption policies to really horrible abuse in hospitals to really merciless and absolutely random favoring of our own children in public employment. We, don't consider, we continue to consider ourselves to be good people and them essentially to be bad people, and they get it. And that's a, so there's a real, and, and with a certain tendency in everything that we do to turn it into a legal issue. To, to not do politics, to try and block politics through um, a certain form of legalism, which obviously that's the human rights is the, is the favorite turn. And the third thing that we found really was that culture eats policy for breakfast, is that they're not listening. It, it, like yesterday, I've got really good friends in Turkey and they rang me and said, oh my God, you know, Ertegun won again and yet we, the left, were offering higher standards of living and a better economic prospects completely beside the point. If you, if you don't work within the experience of people and you don't connect with people and there's no element of trust, um, you, will, you, will, you will die. So just to conclude, what I want to say is that we have, I think, certain truths to guide us um, that I've found are, you know, I don't want to say, I don't want to get involved in a really horrible methodological dispute in the social sciences about time and relativism, but I would say that they're ancient truths, they're weathered truths that can guide us. We're not without guidance. And the first is, is that capitalism turns human beings and nature into a commodity, and that's unsustainable and needs to be resisted. So the first is that we can take a leaf out of not Karl Marx, but Karl Polanyi's book, and say that there is an issue of commodification, um, that the state has a tendency to turn us into administrative units, 
once again to disembed us, to destroy relationships. But there is such thing as relational power. Relational power is the alternative to state power and money power. But to build relationships is not what we're good at. We're very good at position papers. We're very good at drawing red lines. Fantastic. But we're not good at building relationships. The great truth that we know is that you cannot do it on your own. Whenever I meet people and I say, what do you want to do? And they say, well, I want to make a difference. I always say, well, don't you think you should meet some people you know, to make that difference and talk to it? You cannot do it on your own. That's a fundamental truth that other people exist. It's important to remember that other people actually exist and you've got to build a common, common life with them. And, and I just wanted, and, and just, to, just to conclude, it's, 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 it's something that we don't like to think about, but there has to be not only le is leadership and the development of leadership necessary for democracy, but the leadership of the poor is an absolute precondition of fundamental change that we need to relate to and, and develop um, the leadership of the poor, because it's actually among the poor that the real relationships are taking place. It's when people have no choices and they live together, people of different religions, people of different types, and they have to work together. The real work that I did that was the best work was precisely this living wage work, bringing together people of different backgrounds who had a common interest in being treated with some dignity. So I really hope that that's a useful contribution along to the work of Shacharit. I really thank you very much for your invitation. Thank you.